Welcome back to the Wyatt Claypool Show, everyone. Remember back in 2015 when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Liberals actually tried to come off as moderate and pragmatic to Canadians? Well, that's all out the window. They now seem to be on a mission to make sure that not one Canadian thinks that they are in touch or sane by the end of their term in 2025. They used to even pretend that they liked the Canadian oil and gas industry, and that myth has been long since busted a long time ago. They absolutely hate our oil and gas production, especially that which happens in Alberta. But now, it's not even enough for the Liberals to just be against oil and gas. They are now against electricity, or emissions, I guess, produced from electricity. Even though we kind of need it to survive, I guess it's now time for the Liberals to target people for using too much electricity, because that's a major problem. Can't have people with good qualities of life in this country now, can we? Before I get into clips about this specific issue, I just quickly want to give you guys a reminder that if you're not currently subscribed to this channel, just go and hit the subscribe button, like this video, because about 75% of people watching any particular video from me are usually not actually subscribed. And then if you want to help support the show, go click the Give, Send, Go link in the description below or pinned at the top of the comments if you want to help our legal fund. And you can also sign up on my website, wyattclaypool.com, if you want leadership or nomination recommendations, both federally and provincially across Canada. I'm putting together a list, so if there's any interesting nominations or leadership races going on, I can email people and let them know good candidates to look into, good movements to be able to join, all that sort of great stuff. Anyways, Without further ado, let's get into this clip that was post, posted by Bruce McGonigal. Uh, he does a really good job of posting clips on X from different committee meetings as well as question periods. So go give him a follow if you happen to use X. But here is our natural resource minister, Jonathan Wilkinson, actually saying that although he hates oil and gas and the emissions from that are bad, we also have to look at the emissions from travel and electricity as also a ba massively bad thing. Um, at the end of the day, oil and gas represents 31% of emissions in this country. It must begin to go down, just as transportation and electricity and everything else. But if you are thoughtful about this, not backward looking from an economic perspective, but think about how insane that is. We actually don't need to watch much of this clip. That's absolutely ridiculous. At the end of the day, oil and gas represents 31% of emissions in this country. It must begin to go down just as transportation and electricity and everything else. Must begin to go down. And it would be backward looking for us to just ignore that problem, I suppose, of people using oil and gas products, traveling, and having to keep the heat on and electricity on in their homes. I, I assume what he means by the oil and gas industry is only 31% of emissions is that extraction, refinement, and other things to do with oil and gas products directly are only 31%, because obviously transportation electricity also has to do with natural gas and gasoline. But that's just such an absurdly insane position, that it must begin to go down. Not that it can go down over time if we have more efficient ways of using it and we can get more bang for our buck, because that's what capitalism has always been doing across human history, that we like to take the same size tank of gas much further because it saves us money. And that's the great thing about capitalism is that environmentalism and capitalism should actually be two allies because the definition of what a gas guzzling truck has been since this 1970s to now is very different. We're actually very good at making sure that we can use the same amount of resources to accomplish far more things. That's why if you ever see a coal power plant, although they phase them out across most of Canada, they don't have black smoke coming out their smokestacks because that's waste. And so the power plants used to now, before we shut them down, recapture all the escaping coal dust and be able to reburn that for more power. This is the, but not, none of this has been accomplished by government. But now we must reduce electricity emissions and travel emissions. That's just anti human. They are not beating the accusation that they are far-left degrowth environmentalists, people who think that the best thing for the planet is not just that we become more efficient with our use of you know, uh, emissions-heavy products or whatever. It's that we must 
like just degrow the economy. We must become smaller. We must all have smaller homes, only own one car, if even own a car or use public transportation at all. It is an anti-human perspective. But, and that's our natural resource minister. The guy in charge of our natural resources has a steep hatred for the natural resources of Canada. I find it just absurd. Uh, here's another clip also posted by Bruce McGonagall saying that they want to reduce uh, Canadian oil and gas emissions uh, with the cap that they're putting in place in order to basically just stop us from extracting and refining. I'm proud to introduce Canada's draft regulations to cap pollution from the oil and gas sector. Those regulations will help to cut pollution by 35% below 2019 levels while providing compliance flexibility. In doing so, we will create a... By the way, compliance flexibility basically means bribes. If you pay the government by or invest in green tech, then they will give you more carbon credits so that you can burn more. So if let's, if it was such a big deal, if burning oil and gas products were such a horror show, why would you ever let people have offsets to keep burning it? It's not. It's just a scam, basically, at this point. They are just looking for more money from the industry, and these are taxes and regulations are a great way of extracting more value and shifting it towards Eastern Canada, away from Western Canada, where people don't vote for them. Cap and trade system for the sector. It will reward low polluting facilities and incentivize higher polluting facilities to invest. So what this means, it means no matter what happens to production, the pollution level will go down. By the way, Stephen Gilbo here, our environmental minister, if you don't remember, actually referred to himself as a proud socialist. And it's absolutely showing here. The man doesn't understand economics at all. If there is a plant that is a higher emissions plant, and you're going to tax them to make them invest money into reducing emissions, they're not emitting for fun. They are wanting to probably be as efficient as possible. And they just don't have the money together to upgrade their plants or to invest in more efficient processes. It's such a stupid lefty position that the way that we make people do things the better way, the more expensive way, is by taking their money away so they can't invest. That's ridiculously stupid. When you pull, put a tax in place trying to get people to do something, usually you're trying to get them to do it less in general. Just stop. If you put a tax on cigarettes, you're trying to get people to stop smoking. If you put a tax on oil and gas and refining and all these and like emissions, you're trying to end the emissions. You're not just trying to reduce them a bit or you would probably give them a tax credit in order to reduce because that is an actual positive incentive. You're not trying to bankrupt them unless they do what you want. That is a negative incentive and negative incentives, in my opinion, have never been good. They're just not efficient at all. Every time we put up more taxes on our economy, things just slow down more and investment stops. And there's another clip I think I saw. It was from Rebel News. I don't need to pull it up here. But Stephen Gilbo is saying that we've accomplished getting Canada to our lowest emission levels ever. And it's funny whenever I see the liberals uh, suddenly believe in per capita emissions uh, metrics when usually with the GDP, they never like to talk about per capita because mass immigration has shredded our per capita income and wealth in this country. Our real G our GDP keeps going up every year. And even then, it's not even going up that much, but our per capita falls. So they only talk about the, the raw GDP. But when it comes to emissions, they never talk about raw emissions because Canada's raw emissions go up every single year. So instead, they talk about per capita emissions. Which is funny because now they're trying to say that it's the carbon tax that caused this, even though per capita emissions since the 50s has been going like this. Emissions have been going down because, again, capitalism's great. People are greedy and they want to use the same tank of gas to go 50 kilometers further than they used to. And But because Stephen Gilbo and the liberals put in place the carbon tax in 2019, suddenly all of the per capita emissions are because of the carbon tax. And by the way, the steeper drop-off on emissions we saw after 2019 had nothing to do with the carbon tax. What happened is COVID hit, and basically the Canadian government, the provincial governments around Canada, shut down the economy. And so our emissions basically flopped like the GDP did. Our GDP went down, and our emissions went down in line with it. 
And since then, it's been kind of slowly creeping up as the as the economy comes back onto line and uh, comes back online. And Stephen Gilbo is pretending that this is a big success of the carbon tax. It's not. You can't tax an inelastic good to get people to stop using it. If you tax food heavily, people are not going to suddenly figure out a way of just be photosynthesizing in the sun. They will keep eating food even if you tax it. People will keep filling up their truck even if you tax it. Some people will go to public transportation. It's a very tiny amount of people, and that's usually because you've pushed them into the floor when it comes to their incomes, and they can no longer afford to even fuel up their car, so now they're having to take the bus. But that's not exactly a reality I like. As time goes on, though, the liberals have been getting more and more radical with their rhetoric. They know the pure poly of conservative train is coming in 2025. I talked about this yesterday in a, a video just about the polling numbers that are out there showing that a lot of people are coping on the liberal side of things whenever a scuffed poll comes out. I don't mean a rigged poll, but just a bad poll comes out showing that they're actually up in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, not realizing the sample size was 40 and Ecos also doesn't really have much of a reputation worth defending these days. Frank Graves runs Ecos, who also puts in all those very strange questions around disinformation and misinformation, where the entire questions are rigged to try and get conservatives to say that they believe in things that Frank Graves arbitrarily decides is misinformation. Like a piece of misinformation he includes is that, do you believe that Canada's GDP growth is the strongest in the G7? If you say no, that's misinformation. Because in a technical sense, he's right that our GDP is going up faster than any other country in the G7. But most people, when they get that question, they'll be like, our GDP per capita is way down. Our country is doing really bad. You're not thinking that, oh, technically in some really stupid metric, our country's growth, our economic growth is going up because we imported 1.3 million people. Don't we feel great about the economy? It's not because I don't think ECOS is rigging polls to help the liberals. Even their trend lines show the conservatives are ahead and are staying ahead. But it was ridiculous seeing so many liberals pretending that the ECOS or Nanos farting out a plus 12 or plus 14 for the conservatives means that there is a room for a comeback for Justin Trudeau when all the other pollsters are showing a plus 18 to plus 22 lead for the Conservative Party of Canada. But here is a great clip. Of a of a liberal MP, Adam Van Koverden, whoever I don't know. I'm sorry to Dutch people. I'm bad at saying your name sometimes. But this liberal MP who is having an absolute meltdown over the potential risks to Canada's democracy that pure polya poses. This is just obviously overheated and irresponsible rhetoric. But it's okay when liberals do it. Sure. What I'm focused on is my constituents. I'm focused on is beating Pierre Polyev in the next federal election. He poses an existential threat to Canada's democracy, in my view. He also uh, has committed to tearing down some of the institutions that Canadians rely on. An existential threat to Canada's democracy. How? How is, how is Pierre Polyev a threat to Canada's democracy? What has he done at all that would make you think that we're not going to have elections if Pierre Polyev becomes the new prime minister? What institutions is he ripping down? He's not actually going to go after any institutions. And when I say institutions, I mean like he's not going to get rid of healthcare. He's not going to get rid of the judiciary, real institutions of the Canadian government. He's not getting rid of social security. He might get rid of the CBC's funding. That doesn't actually even mean the CBC goes away. That means that taxpayers no longer have to subsidize a failing media company that hates them if they vote conservative. Yes, there are some good people who work for the CBC. Absolutely. It's hard to spend 1.4 billion people, a billion dollars staffing your news outlet and not get some good people. But for the most part, it's a complete money drain. The CBC, in fact, spends more per capita on Canada's media market than Fox News does in the United States. Because $1.4 million, when you consider the population difference, is $1.4 billion is way bigger than in, in Canada's population than Fox News' budget is in the United States. It's like not even actually that close. There is a significant like 30 to 40% higher budget per capita in Canada for the CBC than Fox has in the United States. But 
what he wants to get rid of CBC, I guess. I guess maybe that's a threat to Canada because Canadians can no longer get responsible state media information. Um, he wants to get rid of the dental care program, potentially the, the $10 child care program. They're not good programs. They're programs that are doomed to fail in the future because you can't keep having less and less people pay for more and more services for others. That is how you bankrupt a government. That's how we had the debt crisis in the 1990s in Canada. Everything became way too weighed on. The private sector shrank and the government sector grew, demanding more and more money from the private sector until finally Jean Chrétien as well as many premiers across Canada like Ralph Klein and uh, Mike Harris had to just significantly shrink their government budgets because it had gotten out of control. So in fact, if we're thinking that the conservatives cutting things are the risk to our democracy and our institutions, in fact, you should be blaming the liberals for having ruined the budget and made it necessary to cut lots and lots of waste out of the Canadian government. Oh, anyways. Now I want to see if I can move on to some. Oh, here's a, here's actually a really good. Oh, actually, never mind. I want to go to another pure uh, Stephen Gilbo video. So this is a video that Stephen Gilbo posted. I find it endlessly funny whenever liberals put out attack odds on Polyev these days, because there's always a few different themes. You know, Polyev is is vaguely scary in some way. He believes in misinformation as well as he wants to cut the government budget, in which none of those things actually appeal to Canadians right now. People don't think Polyev's spreading misinformation because he's not. Canadians are not scared of budget cuts because 62% plus of Canadians believe it's actually necessary to reduce government spending. Nobody thinks that more than 44% of our GDP should be public sector spending. And then also, nobody actually considers pure Polyev a sinister figure that lives up to the vague kind of Polyev's a bad man. Polyev's coming after you. He's going to go after your rights. He's going to go after your whatevers. No, I mean, he's going to go after your pride parades and abortions or whatever the liberals are saying these days. He's just not. And especially on the the, the abortion type of uh, side of things that the liberals keep going on about, I'm pro-life. I can tell you the federal conservative party right now is not pro-life. There are many pro-life MPs, but the party itself is not pro-life. So it always is always annoying to me every time the liberals or liberal cheerleaders online go after the conservatives as like dangerous pro-lifers, which is ridiculous. The liberals, in fact, are complete goblins on the issue of life. They literally voted down a conservative proposal that all the conservatives voted in favor of. And I actually believe one NDP guy voted in favor of. So credit to him. I had to go figure out who it was. But it was a bill to have upgraded sentencing. Or if a pregnant woman is murdered for obviously the loss of her child as well. Or I think it was also assaults on a pregnant woman if the child is lost. The liberals, basically all the NDP and the Greens voted against that. That's not being pro-choice. That's just being a complete goblin. It couldn't even vote to make it so, so that someone's compensated for an actual real loss. Oh, well, that would be too pro-life. That would be giving humanity to an unborn child to have upgraded criminal sentencing for somebody who is beating on a pregnant woman. Just nasty garbage like stuff. Anyways, here's the video that Stephen Gilbo put up. Who's really pulling Polyev's strings? See, the, the vague insinuation Polyev's a bad guy. Who is Pierre Polyev really looking out for? He likes to tell Canadians that he would ignore corporate lobbyists and only listen to the people. But newly released documents tell a very different story. Elections Canada fundraising reports have now revealed that on July 5th, Polyev held an exclusive closed door fundraiser. <laughs> closed door fundraiser? They realize that most fundraisers are closed door. You can't just walk in and start having some brisket when you haven't donated any money to the party. I always find it funny how the liberals, and actually I've even seen conservatives do this before too, but people exploit the ignorance of the public on how fundraising and politics works to pretend this is all mis like spooky and scary. It's not. It's how anyone fundraises for anything. There are closed door fundraisers for veterinary clinics, for free veterinary clinics, charity clinics. There are closed door fundraisers for children's cancer charities, 
I don't think they're up to anything behind closed doors and we got to kick down the door and see what all these people are up to. I'm pretty sure they're giving money to the guy. Oh, like, but big oil and gas guys are giving money to Polyev? Say it isn't so. Say it isn't so that oil and gas executives would be giving the legal maximum, which is only $1,750, like, like, seven, like $1,750 and like I think like 40 cents or 50 cents. They're giving that to Polyev? Whoa, sound the alarm. Oil and gas guys are giving money to the guys, to the party that do- doesn't hate them? Whoa, uh, my mind is absolutely blown. My hair is on fire. You just can't see it. With dozens of oil and gas CEOs and executives, where he took massive donations from each of them. And this wasn't the first time. From each of them? He didn't just have a fundraiser where he gave he took money from a single guy. He, he took money from each of them. Each? Wow, I'm spooked right now. I'm not sure if I can like leave the house. The the Jimmies have been scared off of me because Polyev's making fundraising. Goodness, call call out actual corruption. If you find a conservative politician doing something actually corrupt, I want you to call it out right away. What is this though that we're pretending that oil and gas like oil and gas guys shouldn't be able to donate? That's really what Stephen Gilbo wants here, because apparently, like, it deserves the the booming music, like, like it's a new, like, a Brad Pitt zombie movie. Wah! Pierre Polly of his fundraising money. Wah! Isn't that scary? Wah! Threat to democracy. Ah! In May of last year, Polyev, once again, held another fundraiser with a who's who of the oil and gas industry. This isn't an accident, and it helps explain why he is deliberately undermining policies that fight climate change, even if it will cost Canadians more. He has systematically opposed any and all measures designed to cut pollution in the oil and gas sector. The, as we've talked about, the, the, the pollution has been going down for years because people like being efficient. Oil and gas companies like being efficient, so they've reduced their emissions on their own you'd think that there's going to, they're going to show off like a photo on screen of like pure poly of shaking hands with Kim Jong-un and Saddam Hussein at the same time. And drive innovation in clean technology, including policies supported by previous conservative leaders. During his 20 years as a member of parliament, Polyev has voted nearly 400 times against measures designed to protect the environment. Based. His promise to Canada's biggest polluters is that they can put unlimited amounts of pollution into the atmosphere for free. Pierre Polyev will pretend he is standing up for Canadians, but now it's clear he's only standing up for his wealthy donor friends and big oil lobbyists. But no, the liberals don't have big big donors. They don't have big donors. They have lobbyists. They just have little little guys. They just have little little baby donors, little baby guys here, just giving them little bits of money. Liberals don't won't let you give them more than twenty bucks. They're too good for that. They, they don't need that. They just need their little donation, little little guys, little ones. <laughs> Maybe this is why the liberals aren't doing so well in the fundraising these days. Uh, if I can bring this up on screen, I already made a video on this. But in the third quarter, the liberals only brought in. $3.32 million while the conservatives brought in 8.4 million. And that was a that was a downgrade from what the conservatives brought in in the second quarter. But obviously it's gonna uh, ramp up again once we get into the holiday season here. But the liberals haven't even been within double of what the conservatives have been fundraising. And they have Bay Street donors. I don't really care to like demonize that. I don't care, get money from whoever. I actually think that the donation caps in Canada are way too low. $1,750 is nothing when you consider the fact that when you consider the fact that in a Canadian federal election, we probably spend less than like a Pennsylvania Senate race, an Illinois governor's race where you know who's going to win it. Somehow we spend nothing in Canadian politics whatsoever. It's actually pretty like it's actually kind of bad for democracy because it means that parties can barely spend on advertising. So the average voter is not really that well informed on what the platforms are of each of the parties. And so most people will get most of their election information through like the CBC, CTV News, Global City TV, in which you're not going to be getting a non-biased take. The way the CBC, in my opinion, I've, I've actually said this to people at the UCPA GM a lot when we were discussing it, the CBC's best tactic at pretending to be neutral is being as boring as possible. The CBC is very left, but 
because they talk in such boring ways and their shows lack any charisma at all. You're like, well, this must be somewhat neutral because this is making you want to fall asleep, even though it is a lot of leftist drivel uh, sort of inserted into a lot of the stories. A lot of left wing assumptions are baked into the way that they cover things. So they will be hosting tons and tons of people who are going to call parental rights bills, especially the one that just came out in Alberta, being like transphobic or homophobic. It's not, but that's just the left-wing assumption that the CBC makes because it is mostly run by leftists. Oh. Anyways, let's let's end on something a little bit more fun, and it's going to be the... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to skip that. I was going to talk about taxes, but I don't think anyone wants to hear about how bad Canadian taxes are right now. We're going to talk about another lefty TikToker, because I find it fun. This one being Frank Dominic, who you've seen before. You can go follow him if you want there on X. Uh, but this is the title of his video. If we had a ranked ballot in Canada, how would Canadians vote? I created a survey with Reed Forum to find out. And I I actually find this decently interesting that he did this, but I just want to critique the illogic of the idea that somehow ranked choice voting in a Canadian federal election would somehow mean that we would have more democratic outcomes. I, I, I'm a very much a believer in the first past the post system overall, especially I'm basically in favor of whatever system we've been using for a very long time because our entire electoral system, our party system has already adapted to the current uh, to the current uh, way we way we vote. And so like for an example, that's why I don't like pure proportional representation because every time someone takes the results from the last election and they just run it through a proportional representation algorithm with whatever threshold they have to be able to start winning seats, it's taking a first past the post election and just assuming we had voted like it was proportional. That's not how that works. You would have so many parties pop up overnight to run in a proportional representation system because you don't need that many votes to get one person across the finish line. You don't think the Christian Heritage Party or the Marxist Leninist Party or you know the some other random parties would start being able to elect a single guy, especially if it's pure proportional representation where all you need is the exact percentage of the vote in order to get one uh, person across the finish line. Maybe it would be regional-based but still, even then, I find it a bit arbitrary there. Oh, I believe in proportional representation, but regionalized, and you have to have 5%, and you have to, I'm like, okay, well, that's not proportional representation, and you don't actually want proportional representation. You want a version of proportional representation that gets your favorite party the most amount of seats. But anyways, here, let's go into uh, Frank Dominic talking about proportional representation here. How would Canadian voting intentions change if we had a ranked ballot system? I was curious, so I created a survey in collaboration with the Angus Reid Forum to find out. As it One, the guy has to lay off the speed or the coffee. One of the two. I talk fast, but I have to give Frank Dominic an award because he talks somehow faster than I do. It stands right now, most Canadians would still be voting for the Conservative Party first. Where it gets interesting, though, is how few people would have put the Conservatives as second or third, their next big bunch of support coming from a fourth ranking. What that implies is that most people who are voting Liberal and NDP would not be ranking the Conservatives as their second vote, nor as their third. And as you can see, for first, second, and third, both the Liberals and the NDP are evenly split, meaning that regardless of whether or not they're voting for the Conservatives, the Liberals, or the NDP, a lot of people are willing to vote for the Liberals and the NDP second and third. Showing, but, but this is where this is where he's like losing me very quickly. I don't. Why do I want more people elected into our government who people only wanted on a second or third ballot? Right now, in the polls, the Liberals and the NDP combined wouldn't be as much as the conservatives in most polls. And even then, I don't think if the NDP just disappeared tomorrow, that most of their voters would even go liberal. I think a lot of them would either sit home, potentially vote green, or even vote conservative. Because it's just, there are different parties for a reason. If they actually had the same appeal, one party would have already taken a dirt nap at this point. The NDP and the liberals keep moving closer and closer together because their party leaderships are completely ridiculously stupid. Uh, like the NDP should be leaning more into their blue collar appeal that they had under Jack Layton if they were smart. And Trudeau would stop chasing the woke voters that Jagmeet Singh has been trying to monopolize on university campuses. But this is, I don't consider this democratic that we would, and I'll at least let him finish and then I'll make my point at the end. 
significant that those parties have a wider base of support. While the first ranking conservative vote is strong, after that it dies down, whereas the liberals and the NDP are more palatable to a wider range of voters. The Greens really shine in third place. To me, this indicates that the voters who are voting the liberals and the NDPs first and second are then voting Greens third, and then they put the conservatives fourth. But what's super interesting is that the PPC are dead last. How would you rank your ballot? Leave it in the comments. Why would that be interesting? Everyone knows the PPC would be dead last. They're literally the last place party in the polls. Anyways, but how will that, that, that is just something very silly to me in my mind that like, oh, well, see, it actually is bad if the conservatives win because that's the implication here. The conservatives win the next election in 2025. Well, it's been a disservice to all these NDP and liberal voters who they could have like they wouldn't have voted a conservative second ballot or third ballot. Okay, what does that mean? It will vote for the party that you think can win in your area. People are functioning adults. If they they know if they live in a riding, if the liberals have a better chance of beating the conservative or the NDP does, the reason that people don't end up consolidating behind that option is because they don't really like the option that much. The the ranked ballot is making it up, is creating an artificial agreement. It's creating artificial uh, consensus behind this like second or third uh, place party saying, well, they if we can consolidate all this stuff, well, then it's better because more people kind of liked them. Okay, but if 43% of Canadians like the Conservatives, what does it matter that we could technically jam all the other parties together with a, a few passionate people and mostly apathetic people to outweigh them? I think it means more that you can get 44 42% of people to say, yes, I want you, rather than just 22% saying, yes, I want you, and another 20% saying, eh, I suppose. That's my problem with the stupid rank choice voting in federal elections. Rank choice voting is fine in like a leadership race or like a nomination within a singular party where everyone presumably has generally shared values and now we're mostly ranking personalities. Who do I trust the most? Who I think would be the best representative? Who has the most experience? Who is the best communicator? That's fine. But once, but even in those cases, you often sometimes get turkeys of candidates or leaders like Ed Stelmack when it goes down to like a fourth or fifth choice and people are just kind of picking the compromise guy. And so nobody actually is really happy. We just have a bunch of people who compromised on a bad choice. This happens in proportional representation systems all over the world. Israel most notoriously. Nobody agrees, so they constantly have elections, and nobody is incentivized to stop voting for their very oddly specific interest, uh, interest party that holds up the government if they don't get everything they want. Proportional representation does not make everyone more representative. It makes pet issues go to the top of the of the issue list in government because you can make a stupid pet party around one or two issues and you can hold up an entire government over that even though obviously it's not very representative of what the entire population wants. I like first past the post because it rewards people being able to get a large chunk of people to be able to agree with something. Just because the conservatives are going to get a majority government with 45% of the vote doesn't mean anyone was disenfranchised. It means we took the biggest interest, the biggest, most coherent interest, and we're going to let them have a time, a chance to govern. We don't need to get people, you don't need to get people on board who are voting for fringe issues and throwing 2% of their vote towards the Greens or 3% towards another fringe party in an area. That's not, those are ignorable votes for good reason. They're not ignorable in the ballot counting, but it's, it's weird that we would then have to say, well, you know, 2% of people voted green, so they deserve like six, seven seats or something like that, because that's 2% of the overall seats. That just doesn't make sense to me. If you can't get more than 2% of people in most ridings to agree with you, 4% of people in most ridings to agree with something, there's something incoherent about that ideology that only seems to work in very niche areas. And that's perfectly fine if you can get people in a specific area, a plur plurality of them to send you into parliament. I'm fine with Elizabeth May being in parliament. She represents a specific concentrated interest. And that's the great thing about first past the post. It's you have to be able to represent a concentrated interest. You can't just have shotgun support over across the entire country, or you'd incentivize a lot of PR parties, proportional representation parties, who just dump ads on social media. And as long as they get one person in every, like 1% of people in every single riding to vote for them, they get to send two or three people into parliament. 
it's, it's silly. Anyways, that's it for me today, guys. Hopefully you'll like the longer form Why Claypool Show version of the channel videos. If you want to support us, make sure you donate to my legal fund in the description below. It's the Give Send Go link I mentioned earlier, as well as pinned at the top of the comments. And I encourage you to sign up on my website, wyattclaypool.com, uh, and onto the uh, contact form. It's going to allow me in the future that if there's any big things going on in leadership races, nominations, I'm able to let you know how I'd vote in that area. You can even let me know how you're voting in a local nomination or leadership race. And I can recommend that to other people if I agree with the analysis. Or I can even just be able to present your take so I can find people in the same postal code areas and be able to connect everybody behind specific real orthodox conservative candidates. And so we can avoid having too many red Tories representing us within conservative uh, parties, both provincially and federally. I have two leadership races I'm probably going to be getting involved in in the next little while, not running in them, of course, and I'm probably not going to come onto the ground, but just following, looking into and giving you updates on. And that's Manitoba's PC leadership and the likely upcoming leadership race in New Brunswick, where I am hoping Chris Austin decides to run for the leadership. He is currently a PC MLA, but he was also the leader of the People's Alliance in New Brunswick that was a successful small party that was able to elect uh, three and then two MLAs and two subsequent, uh, subsequent elections. Yes, that's the word. And I think he would be a fantastic, bold leader for the New Brunswick PCs. He wouldn't be going back in the, the red Tory direction, believing the lies that Blaine Higgs lost because he was too conservative. He wasn't. It's because I don't think the campaign was bold enough. I think the campaign went mild, and mild campaigns just almost invite people to go and vote for the other guys. And I think that there is, in general, a populist trend across Canada, not against liberal politicians, but just against incumbents in general. The, the situation federally is very unique to Trudeau, where it doesn't matter if Trudeau was in or out of office right now. People don't want anything from him these days. Anyways, that's it for me today. Have a good one.